All right, welcome guys. I see there's more people on the line. Looks like the uh, people are still joining, but I'm gonna go ahead and kick off here. So thanks for joining us. My name is Zach Snyder. I'm a program manager at the nonprofit Solar Oregon. Uh, you're here at our How to Go Solar and Storage webinar on today, January 18th. This is a recurring webinar that we put on uh, at least once a month for home and business owners who are interested in learning about solar and battery storage and uh, what the technology looks like and how to go solar and how to get battery storage. So if that's you, you are in the right place. We are going to talk about a few topics here. We're going to kick off with a look at the technology. What is a solar system and how does it work? We're going to talk about net metering as part of that. Uh, then we'll look at aspects of your home or maybe your business that will make it easier or harder for you to go solar. And a lot of this involves the roof, uh, but it also involves uh, how much sunlight you get, a couple other things. Then we'll talk about energy storage, which is the idea of a battery that allows you to use electricity when the grid is down. Uh, we are going to talk about the incentives that are available to help you go solar and or storage. And we'll talk about the installation process itself, how to find a contractor uh, and how to uh, specifically find a good contractor. Uh, and then we are going to have a Q&A, and that is a big part of this webinar. Uh, and so I'm definitely going to want to answer all of your questions. I uh, hope you, you may have come here with questions. Uh, you may have questions about solar or battery storage in general, uh, or about things relevant to your particular site. I'm happy to try to answer any and all questions, and I'll show you in a second where you can put your questions into uh, Zoom here. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about our nonprofit. We are called Solar Oregon. We've been around for 43 years, which is quite a long time. Uh, I've been here for the past three of those years, so a very small portion of its overall history. We are uh, we focus on education, outreach, community building, and advocacy uh, to help encourage people to adopt solar and related technologies like battery storage or things like electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. We have a few programs. This, uh, How to Go Solar or How to Go Solar and Storage is our main bread and butter. Uh, it's something that we deliver to communities uh, virtually and also in person around the state. We've been doing that for a long time. We also put on solar tours. Uh, we have a special series of events called our solar showcases, which look at not just solar, but also energy efficiency and the idea of zero energy. Uh, and we've done that both virtually and in person. And uh, we had our most recent event uh, this month, uh, last week, I believe. And uh, it's hard to keep track sometimes. Uh, and we're having another one coming up, which I'll show you in just a second. We also put on a couple of large annual tours, including a large uh, zero energy homes tour that's centered in Portland. Uh, and we also have a our annual fundraiser, the Solar Winery Tour which is a lot of fun. Um, and we focus a lot on peer-to-peer -peer education, things like solarized campaigns, things like storytelling and connecting people individually. We are a member-based nonprofit. So thank you to anybody who's on the call who is a member. Uh, if you're not a member, please consider being one. Uh, you can do that on our website. Uh, there's also a link shown here on the screen. Uh, for uh, making a donation, uh, if you so choose, uh, your support uh, helps to, to fund all of our educational programming. Um, and I'm trying to pull up the chat bar here, which is not wanting to appear, but as soon as it does, I'm gonna drop some links in the uh, chat for you all uh, that will include some links uh, that I'll reference throughout the webinar. The, uh, I wanna tell you about a couple of upcoming events. Uh, there's a series of events that we have called our Green Energy Series, which is put on entirely on a volunteer basis by some of our experienced board members and experienced uh, professional volunteers. 
Uh, we had a, a launch of that uh, last year. Um, we just had our second event and our third one's coming up. It's on utility scale solar. Uh, these are some things that are outside of the scope of what we usually uh, educate about, um, but I think are of interest to people. So I encourage you, these are free events. So I encourage you to check that out. I'm gonna go ahead and put all of the links in the chat box here for you. Uh, one of those links is a links to Solar Oregon events, and you can find all of our upcoming events on there, also on our website. Uh, so like I said, this event's on February 4th. We also have an event coming up, uh, which is a showcase, uh, which is in person at the Win Watts Commons. That's going to be Tuesday, February 7th. This should be a really interesting event. Uh, it is a multifamily building uh, that is uh, zero energy and um, just a really uh, interesting uh, uh, social impact story too. Uh, it's a great way to to learn uh, from the the builders and from non, the nonprofit that's going to be involved, Albertina Care. Uh, and so definitely uh, check this out too. It's also a free event. Um, and then of course we have our uh, solar wine and brew tour, the eleventh annual tour. Uh, is coming up on July 15th. It's going to be at Crosby Hop Farm, uh, and there's going to be several uh, wineries and breweries coming and sharing and pouring uh, their uh, their products uh, for folks. And uh, it's all wineries that have solar um, and or breweries or cideries. And so uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's a great way to support our organization. So definitely check that out too. Also, I want to give a thank you to Energy Trust of Oregon. Energy Trust is an independent nonprofit. They've been around uh, for a couple of decades now and help uh, to make our grid and the way we use energy in Oregon uh, more efficient for uh, a lot of stakeholders. And so they serve the customers of the main uh, large utilities in the state, including the electric utilities, Portland General Electric and Pacific Power. They provide uh, incentives for solar uh, and may soon provide incentives for energy storage. Um, they also support our educational programming. And so thank you to Energy Trust. A couple of quick housekeeping notes, uh, please. Uh, like I said, we I definitely love answering questions. Please put those questions in the Q&A box. And so uh, if you see your menu on the Zoom screen, or if you don't, you might have to mouse over it. Uh, you'll see these icons that include uh, chat and Q&A. Uh, please put the questions, like I said, in Q&A. If you put questions in the chat box, I might miss them. Uh, I try to find them uh, there, but uh, sometimes they get swamped with other information. Uh, and so definitely put them in the Q&A if you want to have those found. I'm also going to launch a couple of polls. Uh, we have these polls to help us understand who I'm talking to right now uh, and also who we're serving in general. Um, so the first poll I'm going to launch right now, you should see a little box show up on your screen. It's asking, where are you joining from? And uh, just pick the response that seems most appropriate for you. And I'm going to give a minute for the responses here. All right, I'm going to give, looks like there's a couple of people wrapping up, but uh, just give a couple more seconds here. All right, thank you guys for that. Um, looks like we've got folks uh, mostly in Portland, a little bit of Eastern Oregon, and also a little bit from uh, outside the pale. So thank you for joining. Um, we also, I'm going to launch this poll. This is, uh, voluntary and anonymous and not going to share this, uh, but it's just Democrat demographics. And this is helpful for us to, uh, report as a nonprofit to our funders. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to fill this out.
I'm going to give one more minute here. I already see a question in the Q&A. That is a good sign. So uh, again, I'll, I'll answer that in the Q&A section, but uh, excited to do that. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and close up our poll. Thank you guys so much. We've got one more quick poll before the webinar. It's two little questions and it's asking your familiarity with a couple of incentives offered by Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, are you aware of their standard incentive? That's the first one. And are you aware of their solar within reach incentive? That's the second one. And I'll give just a few more seconds here because it looks like we're pretty close. All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, it looks as though uh, we've got uh, maybe one person who is familiar, a few people not sure, but a lot of people not sure. So uh, one of the goals of this webinar is to make sure that you are aware. So thank you so much for that. Um, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, I wanna say before uh, I launch in here, we are in the process. We're always updating our curriculum here. Uh, keeping our finger on the pulse of what's going on in the solar market, what customers are experiencing. Uh, and that's that informs what we uh, tell you here. Uh, we just went through also a, a more extensive annual update to a lot of the content. Uh, this webinar includes uh, a lot of that uh, those uh, updates, um, and there may be uh, some additional information that we'll be able to share soon uh, that's in review. Uh, in our next webinar, but uh, just want to let you guys know uh, that uh, this is there's a lot of work that goes into to putting this together. So thank you to all of our professional reviewers who help us with this information. So um, first, let's talk about how solar works. This is a basic diagram of a solar system. Uh, this uh, has not changed. This is uh, a very uh, relatively simple system. Um, and that's one of the things that makes solar so great. So I'll walk you through this. We have the photovoltaic panel up here on the upper left. That is the solar panel. Uh, your solar system will have a number of solar panels. And the uh, solar panels usually uh, placed on the rooftop or perhaps on a ground mount. And I'll show you that in a second. Uh, sunlight strikes these panels and produces electricity. Now it would be that simple, but the electricity that the solar panels produce is in a form called DC electricity, which is not the type of electricity that the circuits in your home use. Your home uses AC electricity. And so in addition to solar panels, there's another electrical device called an inverter, or alternatively, you might have several microinverters. And uh, that device or those devices will convert the electricity from DC to AC. From there, the electricity is wired into your home electrical panel and the electricity flows out into all the other circuits in your home, your lights, your appliances, your refrigerator. If you're charging an electric vehicle, it does that too. Uh, if your solar system is producing more energy than you're using at any given moment, the excess electricity will flow back out through your utility meter and onto the utility grid. And at moments when you are uh, consuming, you're producing less than you're actually consuming, for example, maybe at night, uh, you are still able to draw electricity from the utility grid into your home. And uh, one important thing to note is when you go solar, you get a special type of utility meter called a bi-directional meter. A typical classic utility meter, uh, one that you might already have installed in your home, only records the electricity coming into your home. So when you go solar, you get a bi-directional meter so that you can record the electricity flowing in both directions. And that's important uh, so that the utility can give you credit for the electricity that you are producing and exporting onto the grid. This is the basics of a solar system. It's really simple. Uh, there's no moving parts. That's part of what makes solar relatively low maintenance. 
So let's take a look at inverters and the difference between inverters and microinverters. On the left, we have an image. This is on the outside of the house. It also typically might be in the garage next to the electrical panel. You usually want to put the inverter uh, as close as possible to the electrical panel, though, of course, you can put it on the outside of the home, and that's just fine. Uh, that's this white box here. And this one inverter will convert the electricity of all the solar panels on your roof from DC to AC for your home. Alternatively, instead of having one uh, central inverter here, you might have an array of microinverters. So on the picture on the right, this is not a rooftop installation of solar. We're looking up underneath some solar panels installed on the ground mount. And the reason we're doing that is so we can see these little black boxes here. Uh, and you can see those are the microinverters. There is one microinverter for every one or two solar panels. Uh, and they do the exact same thing as the inverter. You might be asking the question, well, how do I know if I want microinverters or inverters? It's a great question. Uh, it can vary depending on the context. Uh, there, it can vary in terms of cost uh, or some other factors. Uh, your contractor is going to be able to take that into account, design a system for you. They will likely design a system and just make the choice for you uh, based on what they think is correct, but you can always ask them why they made that choice. Let's also take a look at where solar panels can be mounted. There are two principal options for mounting solar. One is on the roof, and this is by far the most common way to install solar. It's a great place to install solar because otherwise your roof is just uh, sitting there under the beating sun, and why not produce electricity uh, with that sunlight? If you have space, which uh, many people do not, but sometimes in rural areas you can, you can consider a ground mount. Uh, this uh, could be a good alternative for you. Uh, however, there's a couple of things to note about ground mounts. One is that A, you need to dedicate that space to the ground mount, uh, and so you can't use it for other things. And B, if the ground mount is far away from your home, the length of wire that you're going to have to uh, bury uh, on your property is going to be longer, and that can increase the cost of the solar system, uh, partially because of the cost of copper and partially because of the cost of the trenching to bury the wire. Uh, but it can be a great uh, alternative uh, if that's the right solution for you. Uh, and that's something also to talk to your contractor about. So when I was showing you the diagram of the solar system and I mentioned the bidirectional meter, you're now able to record the electricity going into your home from the grid, but also the electricity going out from your solar system onto the grid. And the great news is that in uh, most cases, for most utilities, including our large utilities, Portland General Electric and Pacific Power, you have a system called net metering that allows you to get credit for that electricity that you're putting out on the grid. So uh, here's a couple of graphs. I want to walk you through them step by step and show you what's going on here. And that will illustrate how net metering works. So the graph on the left will show uh, a typical summer month. This is when there's lots of sunshine. Uh, and the orange bar is showing you how much electricity you're producing over the course of that month with your solar system. The blue bar is showing you how much electricity you're consuming with your appliances, your lights, and everything over the course of that month, you can see that you're producing more than you're consuming. And this green arrow shows you the net metering credit earned. That goes into a little virtual piggy bank for you. Uh, then take a look at the graph on the right. During a typical winter month, uh, it is cloudier, typ typically in the winter here. And there is less sun. The sun is lower in the sky. And so you might expect that you'll produce quite a bit less solar electricity. Um, and maybe it's less than you're consuming. Uh, and this red arrow shows how much electricity you might be drawing from the grid in that month. Uh, the great news is that you can use the net metering credit earned in previous months to offset that electricity that you're drawing from the grid in the winter months. A couple of important things to note, uh, net metering, the uh, net metering year does not coincide with the calendar year. The net metering year starts on April 1st, and that means that uh, from the start of the year, you're going to be banking a bunch of credits that you can use later in the net metering year. Additionally, those net metering credits, although they roll over from month to month, they don't roll over from year to year. 
And so on March 31st, if you have additional credits because you produced more electricity with your solar system than you consumed over the whole year, uh, those credits will be forfeited. And that has an important implication for uh, system size, which I'll talk about in more detail in just a second. Uh, but I want to show you what the effect of solar is on your energy costs. What does it look? What does your energy bill look like when you have net metering? Uh, this is an example net metering statement uh, from a PGE customer, and you can see uh, that you're going to have uh, the start reading and the end reading during the given month where you're being billed. And you're going to be shown how much you are consuming. So that's how much electricity is going into your home and versus how much you are generating in excess of what you're using. And so you can see that the net period usage is negative 327 kilowatt hours. That means that you earned 327 kilowatt hours of net metering credit. Um, and uh, so let's take a look at what that means over here on the account charges. Uh, you're not being charged for the electricity. So you might be surprised, why do I have a $12 bill here? Uh, well, there's actually around $11 base charge that everybody pays every month just for being interconnected to the grid. You're still going to pay that when you have solar. And uh, that, that money essentially goes to maintain the grid. So whenever the utility line goes down and they send people out in a truck to go repair it, uh, this base charge is part of what um, pays for that, that kind of maintenance for the grid. Uh, there's also some taxes and fees that everybody pays. And you can see those uh, itemized here line by line. However, you're not being charged for the kilowatt hours because in this month you gain that credit. Uh, so compare this to a typical uh, electricity bill of, say, $70 a month. Uh, that is the savings that you'll have with solar, and that will accrue month by month uh, based on how much electricity your system is producing. Over a long period of time, of course, uh, this adds up. Eventually, your system pays itself off, and the electricity you're producing with your solar after that payoff period uh, is essentially added value to you that you would otherwise be paying in electricity bills. Uh, and so in that way, solar is a great way to build wealth uh, over time. Uh, it is a medium to long-term investment. Um, let's talk about system size. As I mentioned, the net metering credit that you earn over the course of the year uh, if you have excess, it will be forfeited at the end of the net metering year on March 31st. Uh, so when your contractor is designing your system, first and foremost, they're going to choose the size of your system based on how much electricity you consume. You want to meet but not exceed your expected annual electricity consumption. Uh, and so uh, your contractor won't uh, design a system for you that's larger than what you're going to need, uh, unless, of course, you ask for that. Um, but just know that if you do design a system that is larger than you need, you just won't be reaping any extra economic benefit from that. Other factors that constrain your system size are available space. Maybe you can uh, load your whole roof up with solar panels and still not offset 100%. Maybe you're offsetting 70%, maybe just 60% of your electricity use. Solar can still be a great way to offset a lot of your electricity costs that way. Um, and it doesn't matter that it's only offsetting a portion. You're still gaining uh, a portion of savings as well. Uh, also, your budget. Maybe you want to have a smaller system that you want to extend later with additional solar panels. Uh, definitely, if that's the case, let your contractor know so that they can design your system so that you can add those additional panels later if that's what you're expecting. A um, Couple of other quick notes about system size. It's measured in a unit called KW. That's different from KWH. And don't worry at all about what that means. It takes a second to wrap your head around it, uh, even if you're in the, the solar industry. Uh, just know that the average size system is plus or minus 8 kW. That's the basics of the solar technology. And now let's talk a little bit about 
your home and aspects of your home's structure and, and roof and the amount of sunshine that you get that can determine whether it's going to be easy or difficult for you to go solar. So this is a diagram of a home with a hypothetical solar system on it. You can see the compass rows underneath, and we're taking a look at what angles of the roof here are really getting sunlight. You can see these arcs with these giant orange beach balls floating overhead. That's the path of the sun in the summer and in the winter. In the winter, it's a little bit lower. In the summer, it's a little bit higher. But the sun is always in the southern sky in Oregon, and that's because we're in the northern hemisphere. That means that south-facing roofs are ideal for solar. They're fantastic. However, east and west-facing roofs can also work just great. The only roof planes you don't really see solar being installed on are north-facing roofs. Uh, additionally, east-facing roofs are slightly less sunny, typically, uh, in some parts of the state than west-facing roofs, and that's because we have a relatively misty climate, and that mist generally shows up in the morning times and blocks just a little edge of that sun on the east-facing roofs. Uh, but overall, uh, between east and west, in the southern aspect of your, your roof planes is great for solar. Of course, you can have a perfect south-facing roof, but if you're thwarted by beautiful, amazing trees, uh, you may not have quite enough solar resource uh, to have a meaningful solar installation for your home. While that's unfortunate, I certainly would not rush to uh, do anything to those trees uh, personally. Um, though people ask about that. Uh, trees also provide a lot of benefit in terms of shading your home, and that can actually uh, decrease your energy usage because you don't have to cool your home as much then. Uh, however, the shade can prevent the solar. Uh, same thing with buildings. It's really hard to assess whether your home is going to be shaded by a tree that's nearby. You might have a massive sequoia uh, just on the northeast or northwest side of your home that's not going to cast any meaningful shade in your home. Uh, you might have that one tricky tree that looks like a small tree, but it's right in the right place that's going to eat up most of the most valuable uh, sunlight, the most intense sunlight that your roof is going to receive over the course of the day. Uh, solar professionals are really good at assessing this, sometimes just over Google Maps. They can get a good sense of whether it's worth it to even get a solar quote. Um, and so that's often what solar companies will do. They'll ask your address and they'll just bring it up on Google Maps and take a look at how much sunlight you get. And then uh, afterwards, of course, your contractor will come for a site visit at some point and confirm that you have enough solar resource. So there's a few things about roofs themselves that can determine whether it's going to be easier, or difficult, or cheap or expensive, uh, relatively speaking, for you to go solar. One of them is the geometry of your roof, the complexity of that geometry. So I'm going to show you two images here. These are satellite images from Google Maps of homes in Portland area. Uh, one on the left is a home that has a whole lot of things going on with the roof geometry. Uh, which are very cool, but uh, can limit the ability for you to install a continuous area of solar panels. Uh, and that is what's ideal. You really want something where you see on the right, where you have a lot of continuous area to install those solar panels. Uh, if you see uh, a home like you, you have in the image on the left, the system, you could install maybe some solar panels on a few of these planes, but it's going to be small. It's going to be broken up. And there might be uh, some slight additional labor and materials cost there as well. Next, and maybe most importantly, is your roof condition. It's recommended that you have 20 plus years of roof life left for solar. Uh, that is quite a bit of roof life left. Roofs have different age lengths and age uh, life expectancies. There are different types of roofs, of course. The one pictured here is a, a standard asphalt shingle roof. They typically have a lifetime, sometimes just 25 years up to 35-ish years. Um, and you'll have to take a look at what your roof's lifetime expectancy was and when it was installed. Um, 
you also want to get your contractor to come and get on your roof and just kick the shingles a little bit and see if it's in good condition. And they can also uh, assess it on the spot that way too. Um, it is recommended, uh, it's, it's not required that you have 20 plus years of roof life. Here's why this matters. When you have to re-roof, you have to re-roof and your solar system will have to be uninstalled, your roof will be installed, and then your solar system will be reinstalled. And often certain components of your solar system will need to be updated. So you'll have to uh, get uh, new connector pieces, for example, for your solar system. Uh, that can add a little bit of cost too. The overall cost of uninstallation and reinstallation, that's a service that uh, solar contractors do provide. Not all solar contractors uh, provide it. Uh, if they're really busy, sometimes uh, you have to wait a little bit. Um, and it can cost up to uh, $10,000 plus maybe even for the whole uninstallation reinstallation job. And so it's really best to have that 20 plus years of roof life if you're going to install solar. Uh, and so that's the reason why. Um, if you have an old roof, it's recommended that you wait until after you re-roof to get solar. And that's for this exact reason. With metal roofs, they have a longer roof life expectancy. And so um, metal roofs are, they're really ideal for solar in a lot of ways, uh, especially the standing seam metal roofs. Um, and so you can get around a lot of these issues. Last but not least is the, what is underneath the roof, your roof structure. So the uh, solar contractor who installs your system will need to get a structural permit through your local jurisdiction. And your local jurisdiction uh, is either your city or your county. Um, in Portland, there are particularly strict structural requirements for solar. It's quite a bit less strict in other parts of the state. So keep that in mind when I say this. Uh, this is mostly for Portland area folks. Uh, your roof structure uh, can be quite significant. Um, there are two basic structures here that I'm, I'm showing on the image on the left, you have trusses and that's where you have these cross beams, both the vertical and the horizontal. You might even see these metal plates here. Uh, regardless, trusses should be A-OK -okay for solar uh, with uh, no issues and it should fly through the permitting system. Uh, if you have rafters on the other hand, on the other hand, where you don't have those reinforcement beams, uh, your, your roof may work for solar, even in Portland, uh, and you may be able to just get your structural permit. Uh, it depends on the geometry of the frame of your house and how far those rafters span. Uh, if they span too far a distance, the permitting department in Portland may require that your contractor hire an engineer to run some numbers and confirm that your home is adheres to code. Uh, that cost can be two to three thousand uh, dollars to hire the engineer. Um, and then if the engineer comes back and says, yep, your home passes, then they'll give you the permit. If the engineer comes back and says, no, your home actually is not compliant with code, they may require that you also install some reinforcements. And that can involve things like sistering, where they'll put another two by four right next to each rafter and screw that in place. Your solar contractor will be able to do this for you, but that can increase the cost an additional several thousand dollars. And so uh, this is particularly an issue with um, urban craftsman homes in the Portland uh, area, um, but and, for, and particularly for older homes. Uh, newer homes, this is not really an issue for solar, uh, and it's not generally an issue outside of Portland. That's a little overview of some things about your site that might make it easier or difficult to go solar. Let's talk about solar plus battery storage. So a common misconception is that solar will allow you to use your electricity when the grid goes down automatically. And that is not true. If you have only a solar system, but you don't have a battery, your solar system will actually shut down and you won't be able to use that electricity during an outage. However, if you add a battery to your solar system, it's the best of both worlds because your solar is able to charge the battery and the battery is able to keep your solar functional during an outage. Uh, so it's a really great combination, combination of technology, solar plus storage, 
for what we call energy resilience. And so that's this ability to use the power when the grid is down. What do we mean? What does this look like? That solar panels on the roof on the right here in the, in the garage may be a battery uh, that powers your home when the grid is down. So why does energy resilience matter in Oregon? There are lots of different types of outages, and uh, so it depends what you're planning for. The standard garden variety power outage, typically caused by storms and or squirrels, uh, storms knocking down trees onto power lines or squirrels chewing through power lines. The utilities are pretty good at responding to those types of outages and getting the your service back up uh, within a matter of a couple of hours. Uh, those, of course, will happen more frequently the farther outside, the farther more rural you are in the grid. Um, and uh, it may be a little bit less frequency depending on where you are on the grid. Uh, so you know if you receive a lot of frequent short power outages, uh, you know if, if that's you, and that might be one thing that solar and storage can help with. Additionally, there is an increased risk of uh, the utilities shutting off the power grid in order to prevent sparking a wildfire with their infrastructure. This started a few years ago in California. Um, there was a deadly wildfire that consumed uh, a town down there. And uh, since then in Oregon, especially during our, since our uh, devastating wildfire season in 2020, that was the first time that our utilities in Oregon uh, started performing these public safety power shutoffs, uh, which is where they shut off portions of the grid during hot and windy and dry conditions. Uh, those also happened this past year. There were a number of places around uh, the state that experienced them. Uh, those are going to be more frequent in Oregon uh, going forward due to increased uh, perception of fire risk and increased fire risk. Um, Additionally, we are in the Cascadia seismic zone. That means uh, the big earthquake, the big one that we're all expecting in Oregon sometime in the future. Uh, it's expected that the power may go off for up to six weeks in the Portland metro area, for example, in the Willamette Valley, uh, maybe even longer on the coast. And uh, so there are. there's also the possibility of a long protracted outage that could be uh, have larger effects in society in general. The question of what a solar and storage system can do for you uh, is dependent on how it's designed uh, and the limitations of battery technology currently. And so uh, definitely think about what you're trying to plan for, because if you're only planning for the uh, big earthquake, you're going to want to communicate that to your contractors so that they know and can set your expectations appropriately. Same thing if you're uh, on a rural part of the grid and just have frequent power outages that you're trying to get rid of. There is a ton of great battery technologies on the market. There really was an explosion over the past few years of these technologies. A lot of these are all UL listed uh, and uh, reliable. Um, the, uh, the In terms of selecting a battery, some contractors will uh, only install one or two of these battery technologies. So if you want to compare different battery technologies, you may need to compare different quotes from different companies, which we would suggest all around anyway as a good practice. But just know that there are good battery technologies out there uh, to choose from. When you are installing a battery and you're thinking about backing your home up during a power outage, you should know that one battery will almost never back up your whole home and all the circuits in it meaningfully uh, and protect your home during a, for a meaningful amount of time during an outage. That's why we have something called a partial home backup. This is where your battery will be wired to some of the circuits in your home and will power those during an outage and not the others. The other circuits will still go dark during the outage. You can contrast that with a whole home backup, which is possible in some cases when you get multiple batteries. Of course, batteries are not super inexpensive. They're actually kind of expensive. And so that can increase the cost of insulation quite a bit. Uh, but it's something to think about when you're considering uh, what you're going for with your battery installation. 
When you tell your contractor that you want a battery, they're going to essentially ask you two questions. What needs power and for how long? So it's very common in a partial home backup to power things like some lights, the refrigerator so that your food doesn't spoil, and maybe some outlets to power a computer and to charge some cell phones so that you can communicate and work and things like that. You'll need to uh, balance that with the question of how long you want those appliances to have power during an outage, because as you add uh, circuits to that list and you add appliances to that list, that's going to potentially decrease the amount of time over which you should expect your battery will protect you uh, when the grid goes down. This is a, uh, a, a full conversation you'll have with your contractor. They'll ask you all sorts of questions, uh, including about what types of appliances you have so that they can start to predict uh, how much electricity they'll use. They'll ask you things about how you use your appliances, things like that. Uh, just know that that's a process that you'll go through with your contractor, and that's part of creating an appropriate system design for you. Uh, last note here, in the case of a partial home backup, uh, the way that you'll actually attach your battery to some of the circuits in your home and not others is that you will take your breaker panel, you'll remove the breakers that you want to back up out of your main breaker panel, install them in a separate essential loads panel. It's a smaller electrical panel. Uh, this is an example of one here with the circuits being backed up uh, in this panel. And that gets wired to the battery. The circuits still in your main electrical panel uh, will lose power when the grid goes down. That's battery storage and the idea of solar plus storage. Let's talk a little bit about the incentives that can help you to go solar. There are a couple of really great incentives for all, uh, uh, well, I'll qualify that in a second, for many uh, homeowners in Oregon. Uh, the one that's available to all homeowners in Oregon is uh, the solar investment tax credit. That is a federal incentive. Uh, it's a tax credit dollar for dollar 30% of the value of your system. It does apply to solar and battery storage, which is new uh, this year since the legislation just changed. Before, it did not apply to batteries. Now it does. Uh, so that's great news, and it's an awesome incentive. Uh, it covers uh, a big chunk of the system there. One thing to note about this incentive is that you're going to apply for that when you do your taxes uh, for that tax year in which your system completed its installation. So if you were to start your installation now and complete it this year, when you file taxes next year is when you'll claim this incentive. Um, and you, of course, have to have the tax liability in order to take advantage of this incentive. However, you can, if you don't have quite enough tax liability in one year, you can have the credit roll over in subsequent years, which is also great. The other main incentive here is for uh, customers of Portland General Electric and customers of Pacific Power. This is provided by Energy Trust of Oregon. This is their standard solar incentive of, it's a flat $500 for your system. Uh, and there are just a couple of requirements here. You have to have your system installed by a uh, trade ally contractor of Energy Trust. I'll talk about that when we talk in the next section about the installation process and how to find a contractor, it's really easy to find a trade ally contractor and most uh, good contractors are trade ally contractors. Additionally, there are a couple of incentives if you uh, are income qualified. So one of them is also offered by Energy Trust of Oregon. It's called Solar Within Reach. And it is up to $6,000 for Pacific Power customers or up to $7,200 for Portland General Electric customers. The income thresholds, uh, so you must fall below this threshold in order to be eligible for this incentive. It's actually relatively generous. A household of four residents can have a combined income threshold of $112,860, $112, excuse me. 
Um, you can find uh, that uh, a specific chart on Energy Trust website, including in the links I put in the chat previously, uh, information about uh, thresholds for each household size, I believe from one to 11 members. Uh, and so uh, you can find out if you're eligible for that incentive. It's an awesome incentive. Uh, and it's, uh, you can tell, a relatively large incentive. Another incentive is the Oregon Solar Plus Storage rebate. Uh, this is a rebate that started uh, based on legislation in 2019. Uh, they started, I believe, funding it in 2020. Uh, and there is still money left. The money remaining is all for people who fall below a specific income threshold. So this is all also an income-based incentive. It's a different income threshold than the Energy Trust of Oregon incentive. You can find information about this on the Oregon Department of Energy website. You search for solar plus storage rebate. Um, the rebate is for up to $5,000 for a solar system and additionally $2,500 for a battery storage system if the battery is installed at the same time as the solar system. Another great incentive, uh, again, income qualified. So we're now on what is typically everybody's favorite slide of this whole presentation, which is a sample budget for a solar system. Uh, and this does not include battery storage. I'm gonna walk us through this. Uh, you should know that it is very difficult to quote the cost of solar without knowing anything about your situation, your home, uh, for a lot of the reasons that we talked about so far in this presentation, including your roof, including uh, your you know, how much sunlight you get, things like that. Also including access to incentives, though of course this budget includes some of that information. Also including your system size because uh, your system size can vary dramatically for solar. So uh, one of the core assumptions here that we're making is that this is a relatively simple installation. There's no re-roofing installed. There's no structural reinforcement or structural analysis required. And it's an eight kilowatt solar system. So let's walk through this. Uh, there are four columns here. Uh, you'll see Pacific Power, PGE means Portland General Electric. Then you'll see Pacific Power LMI. That means that you qualify for both of the incentives we talked about, the Energy Trust Incentive and the state rebate, uh, and you're a Pacific Power customer. And then you'll see PGE LMI, and that means you qualify for those incentives on the PGE side. So let's take a look at where we start here. Assuming an eight kilowatt solar system size, uh, we're going to start with a $32,000 pre-incentive system installation cost. That covers all aspects of installation, including the permitting, everything like that, installation all the way through to where you have your solar system. Uh, we're going to apply the Energy Trust incentive, uh, which is either it's the flat $500 or is the uh, solar within reach, which is the much larger incentive here from Energy Trust. To get to the net cost, and the net cost is um, just uh, applying that energy trust incentive. Uh, then we're going to add the Oregon Department of Energy rebate. That's the solar plus storage rebate. You'll notice it's zero for the non-income qualified folks, and uh, in this case, five thousand for uh, folks over here. Um, and then we arrive at the out of pocket out of pocket cost to the, to the customer. So your contractor will apply for and receive on your behalf the energy trust incentive and and if you are eligible the solar plus storage state rebate uh, so the out-of-pocket cost uh, to you is going to be shown in this row uh, for standard customers it's going to be pretty much the same cost uh, minus five hundred dollars for both pacific power and pge customers uh, however if you have access to that solar within reach incentive that's where you start seeing the upfront out-of-pocket cost drop uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, Pacific Power customers, in this case, might be 21,000. For PGE, might be around 20,000. That's what's paid out of uh, pocket. Uh, note that it's pretty common for folks to take advantage of financing for their solar system. Not many folks uh, pay the full upfront installation cost uh, without using financing. However, of course, that's always an option uh, if it's possible for you. 
Uh, then we are going to apply the 30% federal tax credit. This is something that will be received once you file taxes uh, for the tax year in which your installation is completed. And so this is also a relatively uh, significant uh, incentive, bringing the total net cost of the installation down to roughly 22,000 for folks who are not income qualified uh, or roughly 13 or 14,000 for folks who are. So you can see that the incentives can make a pretty big difference uh, for uh, anybody in the state. Um, and so uh, it's, it's really great that those are there for you. Um, obviously, this is still involves quite a bit of cost. Uh, this uh, price for the solar system doesn't include any of the energy savings that you're going to start to accrue on a monthly basis through the energy that you produce with your solar system. That's not included on this budget. So hopefully this gives you a vague idea of what solar might cost, uh, though, of course, I, I qualified that with uh, a whole lot of assumptions. Uh, including the uh, site characteristics of your home, as well as um, the incentives that you're available that you're eligible for, and the and the size of your system. So let's take a look now at our final section. How do you get started finding a contractor and comparing quotes and uh, getting your system installed? So as I mentioned, if you want to take advantage of any any of the Energy Trust of Oregon incentives, you're going to need an Energy Trust trade ally. These are contractors in the state who are rigorously qualified uh, by Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, this is a program that Energy Trust created uh, a long time ago in order to uh, increase the quality of workmanship being uh, installed in Oregon. It's done a great job of, of doing that. And so I would highly recommend, even if you don't really care about the Energy Trust incentives, uh, if for whatever reason, uh, I would also I would just suggest looking at trade ally contractors because they are rigorously qualified uh, by Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, there is an awesome tool if you want to get three bids from high quality trade ally contractors who serve your area. Uh, you can use this free online tool from Energy Trust of Oregon. It takes about five minutes to put in your information. As soon as you submit the form, your information will be sent to uh, three uh, high quality contractors in your area. They'll get in touch with you, offer you a free quote. Uh, and so it's just a, a way to get the ball rolling. I'm going to put these links back in the chat. Um, and so this is the Energy Trust dash solar bid tool link. If you're going to save any link from the links that I'm sharing, I would say save that link so you know how to get started finding good contractors. Finally, what does installation look like when you go solar? Installation is a turnkey service. That means that as soon as you sign your contract, your uh, contract, your installation company will perform all of the steps necessary, including getting the permits, uh, scheduling on their calendar, getting out, installing the system, walking through the inspections with the local jurisdiction, swapping out your bi-directional meter with your utility and getting you interconnected to your utility, and finally turning your system on. Uh, there is, at times, quite a bit of a weight involved in getting your permits. Your contractor, uh, it may be fairly quick for them to design your system uh, and send submit your permitting paperwork. Uh, however, uh, especially in the Portland area, but in a lot of jurisdictions, there's just a lot of backlog in permitting departments right now. Uh, some people, especially in the Portland area, you may have to wait between two and I've even heard up to 12 months uh, for your permits to be uh, allotted to you. Um, the good news is it's uh, there's nothing that's happened with your home in that time. And so it's really just a matter of waiting. And as soon as you get your permit, your contractor will get you in, uh, set up on the installation calendar. And uh, the great news is that installation itself usually only takes one to two days for a typical residential system. After that, it's usually a couple of weeks to manage the rest of the process. Uh, but once your contractor turns on your system, uh, your system's on and producing clean, 
renewable energy that's saving you money on your utility bills every single month, uh, which is a great feeling. So that is the installation process. Uh, that's the final section of our webinar. We're now going to turn to our Q&A, which I always love to do. I'm going to launch one final poll, uh, which is our post-event survey. Let us know uh, how I did today with this webinar. Uh, and uh, this, this is information that's really useful for us just to track the quality of, of the services that we provide. Uh, so I appreciate your time there uh, filling that out. And as we fill that out, I am going to open up the Q&A box. And I'm very excited to see that we have 11 questions here. So I'm just going to start filtering through these. Anonymous asks, what should we do when getting our roof redone to ensure that it is ready for PV and that adding PV won't void any warranty on the roof? That's a good question. Uh, I am not an expert in roof warranties. Uh, and I think that depends a little bit on the uh, specific roofing product and roofing company, whether the warranty is provided by the manufacturer or the installation, there may be multiple warranties for your roof. Um, I wish that I had the answer to that. I'm actually going to look that up and uh, get that answer for future, uh, future audiences. Uh, however, in terms of what to note, uh, other than the warranty about getting your roof redone to ensure that it's ready for solar, um, picking a roof, there's a lot that goes into that. The cost goes into that, the, the roof type, the roof quality, um, and it's going to, you're going to have to balance things when you get a new roof. And, uh, I would say that if you, uh, are really interested in getting, uh, uh, a roof that's as compatible as possible for solar. Uh, look at a metal roof. There's other benefits to metal roofs. They do cost more, but they have a very long lifetime. Um, that being said, uh, solar works great on a lot of roof types. You just want to make sure that you get it uh, for roofs that have a shorter lifespan, that, you, that you're installing the solar uh, early on. If you are working with a roofing company and you're planning your solar installation at the same time and you're wanting to do them in a one-two punch, one right after the other. Uh, get your roofing company talking to your solar company. See if they can work together. Uh, I've heard that sometimes uh, they don't like to work together. Sometimes they do, um, and it is useful for them. That can be useful in terms of the scheduling. That can be useful. Uh, sometimes even they try to install on the same day. Uh, I'm not sure really practically how much utility that gives them uh, in terms of uh, the installation of the solar, because installation is relatively straightforward and easy on solar. Um, but uh, that's another note for re-roofing. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mix these up a little bit. Uh, what possibility to merge wind turbine with solar on a roof? That's a really interesting question. Uh, there are a lot of things happening in the energy landscape uh, these days. There are uh, micro wind technologies, and those have been around for a little while. Um, they are not something that I have a lot of expertise in. However, there are companies that create systems that are both solar and micro wind. I've seen that, uh, particularly for commercial buildings in places like California, where uh, they're just a little bit ahead of the curve down there. Um, there isn't a whole lot of great wind resource in some parts of Oregon. We do have some of the best wind resource uh, that's offshore, some of the best offshore wind re resource in the world, uh, actually. But um, but I think that the wind resource locally might be one of the questions there. I uh, wish I could give you uh, more specific information. I would just say Google around if you're interested in the specific technologies. I'm not seeing that installed on any residential uh homes anywhere. Anonymous asks, uh, microverter, microinverter equals optimizer, which is a great question. Uh, microinverters are not optimizers. So for everybody's information, uh, this question is uh, about the, con the slide I showed uh, showing an inverter versus a microinverter. 
there's another piece of technology uh, that's added when you have a regular inverter called an optimizer. They look like microinverters. They're also little black boxes that go underneath the solar panels. That's if you don't have microinverters, you just have the central inverter. Um, those optimizers are required by National uh, Electrical Code if you have a, uh, a, a central inverter. And uh, that's because your electrical code requires, uh, your fire department requires that you have to be able to shut down your solar system module by module. Um, that's just part of the National Electrical Code. There's lots of reasons for it. It also gives you another benefit, which is that uh, if a cloud or a shadow is covering one solar panel on your 20 solar panel system, uh, that all the other panels are still producing electricity. Uh, so you get that whether or not you have an inverter or microinverters, and that's because your standard inverter comes with something called an optimizer. Uh, let's scroll around here. How will addition of solar panels affect future value of a home at the time of sale? That's a great question. Uh, I've seen some research on this. However, there isn't really a definitive answer to this. And that's partially because the, the market is, um, does all sorts of things in, in terms of the value of a home. And some it's very a very multivariate, and it's hard to uh, to tell exactly when you're doing research about the price of a home with solar versus one without. Uh, it's sometimes it's hard to really dig into whether solar is what's causing the difference in price. Um, I so I can't give you something that is a, a peer reviewed truth truthful answer to that question, uh, and I don't think a peer reviewed truthful answer to that question exists, not to my knowledge. Um, the, it's certainly something that, uh, depends obviously just like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the, the price of a home is slightly in the eye of the beholder, uh, in terms of how your home is uh, assessed for, for taxes, um, versus just assessed in terms of its assessed value. Yes, uh, it does, uh, count as a improvement, uh, though it does not get assessed in terms of the tax value. That's one of the incentives here in Oregon uh, that we don't really talk about as a standard incentive. But yeah, you won't be taxed on the additional value of your home uh, when you add solar, but uh, but the assessed value um, will increase. Uh, it's a little uh, trick that, that gives solar homeowners a little benefit there. Um, another question here, uh, Matham, what about uh, use of a solar roof model as a technique to heat air uh, past the bottom of the roof to the home. Um, so I think this question is asking generally about how solar affects the uh, the transfer of heat into your home. So uh, if you just think about your home, your home is sitting in the sun and uh, the if the if the sun is beating down on your roof and your roof is your attic is not very well insulated, the sun's going to be adding a lot of heat into your home. The question here might be asking, okay, so we add solar panels. How does that affect that equation? Well, you might think that a lot of the energy that's being converted into uh, sunlight is going to reduce the heat. Um, that uh, that's a good hypothesis. However, you should also know that solar panels uh, give off some heat. Um, and so uh, it's part of the energy of the sunlight striking the panels also converted uh, also into heat. And so it's not very clear, I would say. And uh, I think that there are there may be good uh, modeling studies. Uh, however, there's not a, a fast and straight answer uh, to this question as far as I'm aware. Um, there is uh, also, as far as I'm aware, there's no real difference um, in the, the heating of the attic with solar panels, uh, but uh, I, I just can't say that I've, I've seen definitive proof one way or the other. Uh, will home builders be required in the future to install solar? That's a great question. That's a policy question. Um, so I can tell you that uh, there are, in terms of Oregon policy, uh, if you're interested in that type of thing, there have been a couple of executive orders um, by governor, former 
governor, correct? Kate Brown. Uh, regarding solar in the built environment, one of them was in uh, executive order. I don't want to get this right. I think it was 10, 20, 2017 or 1720. Um, and that required that the Oregon uh, building uh, uh, division uh, would create uh, codes for solar ready for both commercial and residential uh, codes. Um, in terms of what's required, uh, those are solar ready. And so that's not, that's not actually uh, solar being installed. And I would say they're relatively weak solar ready codes. Uh, and there isn't really a sense in which builders are required to install solar uh, in terms of that executive order. Um, I think it's been uh, proposed in a policy context, but I don't think that this is not policy that um, that solar needs to be installed. Uh, that is the policy, I believe, in California. Um, Oregon has not instituted that policy. I think it's uh, there's obviously there's exceptions to that uh, if the builder can show that uh, in Cal this is sorry this is in a California context the builder can show that um, the uh, the building doesn't have enough solar resource then they can get around that requirement um, and so uh, it's uh, it's not policy in Oregon I'm not sure really about the the future because policy really changes uh, pretty dramatically from year to year. Though uh, I think there are people who are trying to push a policy like that forward. Uh, let's see, we've got anonymous. Is there research showing how to? I love these questions. These are great questions, guys. Thank you. Uh, so many, so many specific questions about uh, yeah technical things with solar. I'm enjoying this. Is there research showing how to figure the uh, added value to your home to installing PV? Uh, which would help justify doing it even if you uh, plan to move in less than 10 years. So that's essentially the same as the other question. Hopefully I answered it mostly when I answered the other question. Um, in terms of research, uh, it's really about how the home is assessed. Um, and beyond that, it's about how you market your home in the market. So yeah, it's, it partially depends whether your local home market is one that follows the assessed value of your home or if there's a bit of a bubble. So for example, in San Francisco where people pay cash, you know, twice as much as the home was assessed um, and people get in bidding wars, uh, it's, it's much more about other factors that are more psychological than the assessed value. In places where the market tracks the assessed value of the home a little bit more, uh, then it's really about how the home is assessed. I'm not really an expert in uh, the assessing process, um, though I think that that, that is a, a, it's a good question. Uh, Brent asked about closed captions. Uh, we don't have closed captions, though. If you would like a um, a transcript of this, uh, we could put that together for you. Feel free to email me. My email is in the uh, chat. Uh, Anonymous asks, will an installer allow you to add more PV than you currently need if you anticipate adding heat pumps and EV and or an induction stove? Uh, the answer is yes. Con contractors, uh, I don't think there's any reason a contractor would not allow you to do that. Uh, contractors will typically assume that you're going to use the same amount of electricity that you have used in past years. So they'll ask you for some of your past utility bills, and they'll use that to estimate your future consumption. However, if you are planning to add a heat pump uh, and switch from, say, a gas to an electric appliance, or add an EV, which can add a lot of electrical consumption. Um, then uh, let your contractor know; they'll they'll be able to take that into consideration and uh, factor that in. If what you're going for is a hundred percent offset of, of your electricity with solar, um, uh, Zoom user Doug asks: Is there a recording of this webinar available on YouTube channel, website, link, etc., for future viewing? Yes, we put all of our recorded webinars on YouTube. Uh, I will send out an email following this webinar uh, with a link to the recording. Uh, so you all have that and uh, you can check out all of our other content. We have a lot of content on YouTube. A lot of it is these webinars, but we also have some special events that we put on there. Um, Anonymous asks, I understand there's a way for non-tax paying entities like nonprofits or hopefully homeowner associations 
to get the equivalent of the 30% uh, ITC, how does that work? Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, the, the, I believe that there is a change to the ITC. Again, that's the, for everybody, that's the uh, tax credit incentive, the 30%. That's the really great incentive. The question here is about uh, entities that don't pay tax. And um, I believe that there is a way to claim that as a rebate. However, uh, everything I say about the, the tax incentive uh, should be taken with a grain of salt and anything, really anybody tells you, except for a tax professional. And that's because uh, tax law is tax law and, um, and it's a little bit different. So uh, if you have questions as a nonprofit, I would highly suggest talking to a tax professional uh, about that because they will be, I think, the only people who are qualified to really answer that question. I can give you a tentative answer. Yes, I, I do recall something in the legislation about that. Uh, however, legislation doesn't always match the rulemaking, and I'm I'm not quite up to date on that specific detail because there's a lot in the new law. Uh, but I'm going to look that up now. So thank you. Uh, Doug asks: ground-mounted solar panels versus roof-mounted. Uh, are there many installed in Oregon? Uh, the vast majority of systems are roof-mounted. Uh, however, ground-mounted systems there are plenty of them. Uh, again, those are going to be mostly in rural areas. Uh, Robert, I'm, I'm just kind of skipping around here, so I will get to your question. Uh, Robert asks, any incentives from Solar Oregon if we install the panels ourselves? Uh, we bought the whole system panels, micro inverters, inverters and racking. Uh, great. Yeah, I, Solar Oregon doesn't have any incentives. Uh, we're an education-focused nonprofit, uh, and we don't really have the ability to offer any. Um, but uh, it, Or just incentives generally for... Uh, systems that are self-installed in Oregon. Uh, there are none to my knowledge. Um, the question of whether the 30% tax credit would, uh, that you would be able to claim that if you self-installed, uh, that is uh, something, again, I would ask a tax professional. A lot of these uh, questions like this about the tax credit that are, are not the standard, you know, typical usage of the tax credit, um, I would definitely suggest asking a tax professional. Um, in terms of self-installation, uh, I uh, I would be interested to hear how that how that goes for you. Uh, there are it's the vast majority of people have their system installed by a business. Of course, there are some enterprising people who uh, choose to do it themselves, uh, and I find that interesting. Though it's not really a place where I have uh, expertise, though it is something we get asked about, and so. Um, so it's something we may have information on in the future. Anonymous asks, what effects does dust, what effect does dust have on your PV system? What do you suggest to take care or prevent dust? Uh, dust can occur if you're in a more deserty area like the east, eastern part of the state and you have blowing dust. Maybe you live in a rural area and you have a dirt road and you have blowing dust. Maybe you live in an urban area and you have a construction zone nearby and you have dust. Um, regardless, it does, you know, if you're nearby a, a source of dust, it can be a little bit more of an issue. Uh, typically, uh, because it rains so much in Oregon, sometimes you don't even really need to wash your panels. Uh, I would say it's, it's general guidance in Oregon is to uh, wash your panels once a year. And so if you have uh, access with a hose and you just want to put your thumb over the hose and you can reach all your panels that way, that can be uh, a way to wash your panels. If you have a really tall home, uh, you might want to hire somebody to get up there and wash the panels once a year. Uh, that's the only typical routine maintenance for solar, actually. Doug asks, will installing a solar system on roof prolong life of roof? Uh, that's uh, a, a good question, interesting question. Um, I think that would depend. Uh, there's no, I don't. There's no evidence that that it does prolong the roof life that I'm aware of. Um, I think that there there could be research on that, uh, but I would not necessarily assume that the solar panels are going to prolong the life of the roof. Um, uh, in general, partially just because the solar panels are not going to cover 
the full extent of the roof. Um, and so, you know, when, when a third of your roof that's not covered by solar panels needs to be replaced, uh, you're not going to replace just a 30 year roof. You're really still going to replace the whole roof. So, uh, I think it's probably a moot point either way. That would be my, my answer for you. Uh, expected lifetime of solar system, periodic maintenance this is a great question. Uh, the warranty, standard warranty for solar panels these days is about 25 years. And the inverter, the other significant component in the system, you can usually get it standard to get an extended warranty for, you know, a couple hundred bucks uh, of 25 years. Standard inverter warranties might be 10 years. I would highly suggest getting the extended inverter warranty because uh, it's usually pretty cheap and uh, extending that for an additional 15 years is a great idea. Um, in terms of periodic maintenance, like I said, unless there's something that goes wrong with the inverter or uh, with the solar panels, the only real maintenance is uh, washing the solar panels. Um, the uh, If there is a point of failure in your system, it's more likely to be the inverter than the solar panels. If your solar panels are doing great after the first year, uh, and they don't get damaged by like a tree falling on them or hail, uh, significant hail, um, then uh, you're probably good for the lifetime of the system with the panels. Susan asks, I had a heat pump installed in May. Should I wait to uh, June of 2023, so June of the following year, to get my three bids? Uh, that's a great question. So that I think the question here is, okay, so I recently uh, had a change in my pattern of electricity consumption. Uh, do I need to establish the, the full pattern of my consumption before I get my three bids? Um, the, if you have a record of your electric, electrical consumption before you had the heat pump, uh, I think your solar contractor could, uh, could, uh, you know, do the calculations uh, to get a, a pretty good estimate. Uh, you know, solar contractors estimate solar production pretty accurately, and they do it all day long. And so um, they also estimate uh, energy consumption pretty accurately, and they do it all day long. So um, I would say uh, you can wait, you can always wait, uh, but I, I don't think it's necessary to wait in that case. Doug asks, are solar batteries allowed to be installed inside or outside the home uh, to uh, two hour firewall, et cetera? Uh, let me make sure I understand this. Um, so uh, batteries are uh, typically rated to be installed outside the home as well as inside. It's typical to want to install them inside the home near the electrical panel, which is also near the solar inverter. That's really what you want to look for. Batteries do require space. And so if there is not enough space, sometimes you'll put them on the outside of the home. You'll just want to be conscious of uh, the conduit run then that's required for the batteries. And that's, that's really only an issue in terms of aesthetics and also a little bit of labor and, and parts cost for the conduit. Um, the, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the two hour firewall part of the question. So, uh, if you, if you have a further question, maybe put that in the Q and A and I'm happy to answer that. Uh, last question here that we have, uh, not able to copy chat with resources listed using a smartphone, not able to copy the links listed. Can you email the resources? I can definitely email the links with the recording link uh, in the follow-up email, which will be either this evening or tomorrow morning. Uh, so that is our last question, unless we have something creeping in here. I think that's our webinar. So thank you guys so much. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, it's great to have uh, a, you know, a strong showing uh, in, in our How to Go Solar and Storage. I hope this is useful information for you. Uh, and we're here as a resource to help you in your solar and storage journey. Uh, definitely don't hesitate to reach out with questions about going solar. We'd love to answer them. And check out our future events. I hope to see you at our showcase at Wynn Watts on February 7th. And of course, we have our February 4th 
uh, webinar on the utility grid, uh, which is put on by our board members and professional volunteers. So thanks again, guys. Uh, have a great week and we'll see you soon.